Hello, Isaac here. Uh, welcome back to my channel. Uh, for those that may not be familiar, I create content about history, culture, and theology. Um, yeah, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy this content. So, I'm going to start making a new series on St. Augustine's renowned book, City of God. Uh, my plan is to find an overview and commentary on at least the first five books. Now, as a basic introduction, the City of God is divided into 22 books. The first 10 are a polemic against pagan beliefs and philosophy, in other words, dismantling the city of man. And the last 12 books, on the other hand, tell the biblical story of humanity from Genesis to the Last Judgment, offering what Augustine presents as the true history of the city of God, against which the history of man, including the history of Rome, can be properly understood. But before we get there, I'm going to provide you in this episode somewhat of a historical background to help us better understand the city of God. First, we'll delve into the life of Augustine himself, exploring his conversion. Next, we'll give more of an overview of the book itself, focusing on its central concept of the two cities, the city of God and the city of man, which form the backbone of the work. Following that, we'll examine some of the historical context leading up to the Gothic raid of Rome by Alaric in 410 and the shock that this caused prompting Augustine to write his book in response. Finally, we'll explore the Christianization of the Roman Empire and the transformed political context from the reign of Constantine onwards, the first emperor to convert to Christianity in 312. And with that, the treatment of pagans in that period, which I think is important for understanding the context from which the book was written. So let's turn to Augustine himself. So, Augustine has become incredibly important in Christian thought and history. But what do we know about the man himself? Well, what is unique, at least, about Augustine is that he wrote arguably the first autobiography called Confessions, which delves into his life, thoughts, emotions and motivations which led him towards the Christian faith. And what made this biography unique which transformed the genre itself, is that it was remarkably honest and acknowledged many of his personal failings. As Deborah Campbell writes, scholars studying the genre of autobiography agree that Confessions is a quintessential precedent-setting work. The Roman world often placed a high value and honour, reputation and public image. Authors did not admit failings, but rather presented themselves in a highly favourable light emphasising their virtues, accomplishments, rather than exposing their flaws or weaknesses. Therefore, the level of humility and honesty that Augustine exhibits in Confessions, which transformed this genre of autobiography, is a product of his Christian faith. For just as he recognises his flaws and weaknesses, he also recognises God's grace and forgiveness and the ever-present need for Christ, the source of all our joy and peace, which is why his book comes to its climax in his conversion to Christianity. This comes out quite starkly in the very beginning of Confessions, as he states, You stir us up to take delight in your praise, for you have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless till it finds its rest in you. Therefore, Augustine's life was a restless striving before he found Christ. To begin with then, Augustine is born in 354 in Athagast in modern day Algeria and is raised in a mixed religious household. His mother, Monica, is a devout Christian and his father, Patricius, a pagan who later converted to Christianity. Augustine was well educated in rhetoric, grammar and philosophy and at the age of 17 he went to Carthage to continue his education. But he tells us that he pursued a hedonistic lifestyle whilst in Carthage 
and that this period was marked by an indulgence in sensual pleasures. He writes, I was seething with fornications, overflowing, spilling out, boiling over, I had abandoned you, God, and was drifting wherever the tide of my own desire took me. In fact, no one would temper these sensual desires, as his father was more concerned about his education and his social status. He writes, My father, for his part, was not so worried about what sort of man I was growing up to be, in your sight, or how I kept my chastity. He was interested only to see that my rhetorical powers bore fruit, while instead I grew rank and unintended by you, O God, the one true and good Lord of your field, my heart. The product of this lifestyle was that he fathered a child named Adiodatus with a woman he lived with for over a decade but never married. She was a mistress or concubine, a lower status woman that co-inhabited with a man and his wife. Importantly, Augustine greatly loved his son, Adiodatus, and it deeply saddened him when he died before reaching his 18th birthday. Lastly, in Carthage, Augustine also encountered Manichaeanism and became a follower for almost a decade. For those that don't know, Manichaeanism was founded by the Persian prophet Mani in the 3rd century, and its principal tenant was a dualistic cosmology, which proposed a cosmic struggle between good and evil. Its teachings were preserved in a book called Arzhang, and it drew on elements from Zoroastrianism, Christianity and Buddhism, among other traditions. Now in 383, at the age of 28 or 29, Augustine moved to Rome to teach rhetoric and accepted a prestigious position as a professor of rhetoric in Milan the following year. In Milan, Augustine met Bishop Ambrose, whose eloquent preaching and intellectual depth greatly impressed Augustine. His in philosophical inquiries also led him at this time to explore Neoplatonism, a philosophical tradition that merged the teachings of Plato and monotheistic beliefs. This would influence his understanding of God and evil and lead him to reject Manichaeism, bringing him somewhat closer, at least, to Christianity. In Milan, Augustine also came to realise the deep dissatisfaction all his strivings for honour and fame had brought him. Now 31 years old, Augustine had distinguished himself as a teacher of rhetoric, first in Carthage, then in Rome, and now in Milan. He had achieved a certain level of fame and attained everything that counted for success, material well-being, social status and reputation, and connections to people of influence. And yet, he felt deeply dissatisfied. This comes to the fore for Augustine on the day he recites a public speech in praise of the emperor, in which he would tell many lies and be applauded for my pains by many who knew they were lies. These thoughts made my heart breathless and feverish, tossed by a wasting sickness of anxieties. As an ambitious man, Augustine is willing to lie about the virtue of the emperor if he can win favour with others by doing so. On that same day, however, Augustine and some of his friends walk through the streets of Milan and they come across a drunken beggar who is filled with joy with only a few coins and a bottle of wine. Meanwhile, they had worked so hard for many years to secure success and reputation but remained deeply dissatisfied. As he writes, what he had attained with the aid of a few small coins and begged ones at that, I was approaching by a sirtuous route with many painful twists and turns, namely the happiness that comes from earthly felicity. It was no true joy that he had, but the joy that I was seeking through my ambitions was far falser. He at any rate was cheerful while I was anxious. He was carefree while I was full of trepidation. I should not have regarded my conditions preferable to his, because I was more educated, for I had no joy of my education. Instead, I sought to please men with it, not to teach them, but only to please them. The turning point for Augustine came in 386 through a personal experience. He was in state of turmoil, struggling with worldly desires and the pursuit of truth. But then one day, while reflecting in a garden, Augustine heard a voice of a child saying, Tole lege, take up and read. Augustine picked up a Bible and read a passage from Paul's letter to the Romans which urged him to abandon his sinful ways and put on Christ. 
as Augustine writes. I wept, my heart crushed with very bitterness, and behold, suddenly I heard a voice from the house next door, the sound, as it might be, of a boy or a girl repeating in a sing-song voice a refrain unknown to me, pick it up and read, pick it up and read. I seized it, opened it, and read in silence the first heading I cast my eyes upon, not in righteousness or drunkenness, not in lewdness and wantonness, not in strife and rivalry, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh and its lusts. Romans 13, 13, 14. I neither wished nor needed to read more. No sooner had I finished the sentence than it was as if the light of steadfast trust poured in my heart and all the shadows of hesitation fled away. Therefore, the words jumped off the page for Augustine and it was at that point that he, without hesitation, put his trust in Christ and is then baptised by Bishop Ambrose in 387. Augustine's conversion, we are told, brought much joy to his mother, who was a faithful Christian that had been praying for him for many years. Augustine tells us that when we went indoors to my mother and told her what had happened, she rejoiced. We told her how it happened. She was exultant and triumphant and blessed you, who can do more than we can ask or understand. For she saw that in my case, she had granted her so much more than she was accustomed to ask with pitiable tears and groans. The following his conversion, Augustine decided to return to North Africa, where he'd established a small monastic community in Thagast. In 391, he was ordained as a priest in the city of Hippo, and in 395, he became a bishop, a position he held until his death in 430. He passed away at the age of 75. But it was in around 412, when Augustine was 57, that he began to write his renowned work, City of God, and completed it in 426 at the age of 71. The book began as a response to the sack of Rome by the Visigoths in 410, for the fall of Rome had led many critics to argue that the adoption of Christianity had led to a weakened Rome and left it vulnerable to barbarian invasion. Nonetheless, as Augustine developed his argument, the scope of City of God expanded significantly and it became an extensive treatise on theology, philosophy and history, which offered a Christian interpretation of human history under the rubrics of its central concept of the two cities, the City of God and the City of Man, which formed the backbone of the work. And to this, we shall now turn. So, what is the city of God and the city of man? Well, the Latin word civitas means a gathering of civs or citizens that may live in a city. But in Roman tradition, a civitas extends beyond the town to include all its citizens, wherever they lived. In other words, the Roman Empire was an empire of cities, not of allied nations. But what united these various people is a shared citizenship which coexisted alongside their citizenship of a hometown or city. Therefore, citizenship is central to his argument and to his own experience. Nonetheless, it is important to realise that Roman citizenship was, centuries before Augustine, a privileged status that only a few of those who were not Roman by descent could obtain. For Lucius Julius Caesar, during his consulship in 90 BC, introduced a law that granted Roman citizenship to all Italians, regardless of their origin. But for those living in the provinces outside of Italy, it could only be acquired through means such as military service for a certain number of years, special concession from a Roman emperor or other officials that granted citizenship as a reward for loyalty or as a result of manumission of a slave from within a Roman household. So, Roman citizenship was a prized possession for those living outside of Italy, as those who required it were held in a higher honour 
their non-citizens and it gave them special rights and privileges that non-citizens didn't have, such as immunity from some taxes or the right to have a legal trial or not to be subjected to torture or to appeal to Caesar. But over time, large-scale grants of citizenship became more common and from 212, all freeborn inhabitants of the Roman Empire were granted citizenship by the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antonius. This edict was in part motivated by a desire to increase tax revenue and to bolster the ranks of the Roman army, but it did have important symbolic and legal implications. For all people, the Roman Empire were now united by a shared citizenship and identity. Augustine's family name, Aurelius, suggests that his father's ancestors were in fact freemen, given full Roman citizenship by this in 212. For Augustine then, drawing on this idea of citizenship, the city of God consists of all those citizens of God's city, a city that has no walls, which transcends space and time and even physical being, as it consists of all rational beings who love God and do God's will, including angels or any other spiritual being, as well as humans. The opposite of this is city of man, which has as its citizens all the angels or any spiritual beings and humans who love themselves and want their own way. In book 14, Augustine puts it this way. Two cities then have been created by two loves, that is, the earthly by a love of self, extending even to the contempt of God, and the heavenly by a love of God, extending to contempt of self. Importantly, Augustine did not think that we can achieve the city of God on earth in this age due to the problem of human nature and that we'd have to wait for the age to come and the last judgment when God separated the two cities which are intermixed in this life. As he writes, these two cities are indeed entangled and intermingled, one with the other in this age until they will be separated in the final judgment. Therefore, the city of God exists alongside the earthly city and it will only triumph over it at an appointed time in the future. The two symbols of these two cities in scripture are Jerusalem or New Jerusalem and Babylon. Babylon is like Rome, a city and an empire and the first great empire. But according to scripture, it also held God's people Israel captive from their homeland and is home to the Tower of Babel which is the ultimate image of human arrogance and of humans seeking to assert their own power and authority over God. Contrasting the two cities in Augustine's work, Gerald O'Daly writes, The earthly city is dominated by lust for dominion and the acquisition of empire. It is confident in its own strength and its own values. Not surprisingly, in this kind of society, false religions flourish. In the city of God, on the other hand, Worship of the true God anticipates the fellowship of the saints, humans and angels, that God may be all in all. For Augustine then, Rome is like Babylon, but the seeds of New Jerusalem are present all around us, in those who love God and do his will. While these seeds are currently intermingled with the city of man, they will ultimately triumph over it. The crucial message here is that Rome should not be confused with the New Jerusalem. Even though there are citizens of the city of God who reside in Rome, therefore the fall of Rome to the Visigoths in the 410 should not be seen as a reflection of the faithfulness or lack thereof of the Christian God. Ultimately, the city of God is distinct from any earthly city or empire, and Christians should not equate the fate of Rome with that of the city of God. Moreover, by placing Rome in the same category as Babylon, He's emphasising that even the most powerful human empires are ultimately transitory. In contrast, the city of God is eternal and glorious and Christians should not become overly attached to any earthly city or empire. Moreover, as citizens of the city of God, Christians are part of a society that includes people from all nations and cities and who speak different languages and have diverse cultural customs. In other words, the city of God is a society of pilgrims and Christians should preserve and adopt these diverse customs so long as they do not hinder the worship of God. As he writes, This heavenly city then, while it sojourns on earth, calls citizens out of all nations and gathers together a society of pilgrims of all languages. 
not scrupling about diversities in the manners, laws and institutions whereby earthly peace is secured and maintained, but recognizing that however various these are, they all tend to one and the same end of earthly peace. It therefore is so far from rescinding and abolishing these diversities that it even preserves and adopts them so long only as no hindrance to the worship of the one supreme and true God is thus introduced. During Augustine's time, it was common for people in the Roman Empire to hold dual citizenship, both as Roman citizens and citizens of their respective cities. Similarly, Augustine believed that Christians may hold earthly citizenship in various cities and live in accordance with different laws and customs, but that their heavenly citizenship should take precedence as Christians try to live in accordance with the values and principles of the city of God, which supersedes any earthly city or empire. Considering this, the fall of Rome, while undoubtedly a tragic event, should not be interpreted as a manifestation of the wrath of the pagan gods, nor a sign of the Christian god's failure or abandonment of his people. For Christians, their identity as heavenly citizens provided them with an overriding security, that ensured that they are not defined by the fate of any earthly city or empire, including Rome. So, with that, we shall turn to the fall of Rome itself. So in 410, Rome experienced the sack by the Visigoths led by Alaric, an event that would ultimately inspire Augustine to write the city of God. So what exactly transpired? Well, the Visigoths are one of the two main branches of the Gothic people who originated from the north of the Black Sea that migrated westward in response to the pressure exerted by the Huns, a Madic group from Central Asia in the late 4th century. Seeking refuge within the borders of the Roman Empire, their interaction with Rome resulted in this complex relationship marked by both conflict and cooperation. Interestingly, the Visigoths had converted to Arian Christianity and they were made loyal to it even though it was declared a heresy by the Council of Nicaea in 325. Nonetheless, in 378, the Goths would deal a significant defeat to the Roman Empire, the Battle of Adrianople, resulting in the death of Emperor Valens and weakening the empire's political and military power. Alaric would rise to power in the later 390s, and he had actually served in the Roman army, but went on to lead the Visigoths in a series of campaigns against the Roman Empire, and they demanded land and resources for his people. The Western Roman Empire itself was characterised in this period by a series of short-lived ineffective emperors, creating an environment conductive to external threats. Alaric tried to negotiate a settlement that would grant his people land and resources, but they repeatedly broke down due to Roman reluctance to cede any territory. This led to Alaric to make a more aggressive stance, leading his forces in a series of raids and sieges across the Italian peninsula and they eventually reached Rome in 410. The Visigoths plundered the city for three days, taking valuable items, destroying buildings, and enslaving many of its inhabitants. Once they had departed, the Roman government established some semblance of control, although Rome would never fully recover from the sack. The physical damage caused by the sack was considerable, but the psychological impact was even more significant. Jerome writes shortly after the sack to a noble widow and friend who was mourning the death of her spiritual mentor, Marcella, who had died in the attack, and reflects on the tragic events that had transpired and their broader implications. He writes, Rome had been besieged and its citizens had been forced to buy their lives with gold. Then, thus despoiled, they had been besieged again so as to lose not their substance only, but their lives. My voice sticks in my throat, and as I dictate, sobs choke my utterance. 
the city which had taken the whole world is itself taken. Nay, more famine was beforehand with the sword, and but few citizens were left to be made captives. In their frenzy, the starving people had recourse to hideous food and tore each other limb from limb that they might have flesh to eat. The sack of Rome in 410 therefore marked a significant event as it was the first time in over 800 years that this great city had fallen to a foreign enemy. Rome held immense symbolic value and the Romans themselves considered the city invincible. The Roman poet Tibullus referred to Rome as the eternal city in the first century BC, emphasizing this sense of permanence and invincibility. But following the sack of Rome, the city experienced a sharp decline in population, once boasting a population of around a million at its peak during the imperial era, Rome saw its numbers dwindle to an estimated 100,000. Many sought refuge in the Eastern Roman Empire, which provided security, economic opportunities and cultural continuity. Constantinople, the capital established by Constantine, became a particularly popular destination. Others sought shelter in fortified cities in the Western Roman Empire or fled to the countryside, seeking safety in rural estates, small villages or isolated monastic communities. The sack of Rome in 410 exposed the underlying political and military weaknesses of the Western Roman Empire, marking the beginning of the end as it would ultimately collapse in 476. But in any case, hopefully one can see this importance of the Augustine's book, The City of God, within the context of the sack of Rome in 410 and its aftermath. Rome, once considered invincible and eternal, was in fact now crumbling people were grappling with questions about the significance of this and its implications for their faith and their understanding of the world. The City of God provided a comprehensive framework for understanding these tumultuous times and emphasised that the fate of Rome, or the Roman Empire for that matter, despite its grandeur and historical significance was not the goal or measure of divine favour. Instead, Augustine argued that the true city of God transcended any earthly city and that it was eternal and spiritual, encompassing believers from all nations and cultures. By distinguishing between the earthly city and the city of God, Augustine offered solace to Christians who may have questioned their faith in the wake of Rome's fall, and it reassured them that their ultimate security and identity reside in their heavenly citizenship, which surpassed the temporal glory of any earthly city or empire. Now, with that, we shall turn to the Christianization of the Roman Empire. When Augustine began to write The City of God in 412, the Christian religion had for almost a century enjoyed a privileged position in the Roman Empire. A Constantine became the first emperor to convert to Christianity in 312 and favoured and patronised the religion in the Western provinces from that time onwards. For some context, there was a tetrarchy established by the Roman Emperor, Diocletian in 293. This divided the empire into two major parts, the Western and eastern part halves of the empire, each ruled by an Augustus, a senior emperor, and further subdivided into two parts, each ruled by a Caesar, a junior emperor. The idea was at least that when an Augustus died or abdicated, their Caesar would be promoted to the rank of Augustus, and a new Caesar would be chosen from the military or political elite. This process was supposed to prevent the instability and infighting that had plagued the previous successors of the Roman Empire. Therefore, Constantius Chlorus was appointed Caesar by Diocletian in 293. He was then promoted to the rank of Augustus in 305 when Diocletian and his co-Augustus Maximian abdicated. Constantius Chlorus ruled over the western part of the empire, Roman Empire, while his counterpart Galerius ruled over the eastern part. However, Constantius Chlorus died in 306 and his son, 
Constantine was proclaimed emperor by his father's troops in York in Roman Britain, bypassing the tetrarchy system. At the same time, Maxentius, the son of the retired emperor Maximian, declared himself emperor in Rome. These claims to power led to a series of conflicts between rival leaders. Constantine's rise to power involved defeating rival claimants, such as Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 and Licinius at the Battle of Chrysopolis in 324. After defeating Licinius, Constantine effectively dismantled the Tetrarchy by becoming the sole ruler of the entire Roman Empire to consolidate his power and create a new centre for the empire, Constantine relocated the capital from Rome to Byzantium in 330, which he renamed Constantinople in his honour. This is where we come to one of the most famous accounts of Constantine's conversion from the historian Eusebius. He tells us that Constantine experienced a vision of a cross in the sky before the Battle of Milton Bridge in 312, accompanied by the words, in this sign you will conquer. Constantine then reportedly instructed his soldiers to paint the Christian Cairo symbol on their shields and they subsequently won the battle. With this conversion of Constantine, the transition from a persecuted to privileged church came rapidly. The church had, under the Emperor Diocletian, experienced what came to be known as the Great Persecution from at least 303 to 311. Christian churches had been demolished, Bible and liturgical books were surrendered and burnt and Christians who refused to make acts of conformity to the state regime were deprived of official status and legal privileges and their property confiscated. The origins of the Donatist schism in Augustine's North Africa can be traced back to this persecution. Donatists believed that the moral purity of the clergy was essential for the validity of the sacrament that they administer and argued that the priests and bishops that had betrayed the faith during the great persecution could not perform valid sacraments. As such, they separated from the tainted church to maintain a separate, pure church free of association with those who had compromised. Nonetheless, this situation of persecution entirely changed with the conversion of the emperor Constantine. In 313, Constantine, his co-emperor Licinius, issued the Edict of Milan, which granted religious freedom throughout the Roman Empire and legalised Christianity. Confiscated property was returned to them and the imperial treasury provided funds for the building or extension of churches and the clergy enjoyed special privileges and exemptions. In 325, Constantine would convene the First Council of Nicaea to address theological disputes within the church. He desperately wanted there to be a church united and gave prestige and authority to church councils, building on the already existing structures within the church to achieve this. Therefore, in 325, the Council of Nicaea was convened with approximately 250 to 318 bishops in attendance, along with other priests, deacons and lay people. The primary focus was the Arian controversy, which argued that Jesus was a created being, separate and subordinate to the Father, this view was opposed by Alexander and Athanasius, who maintained that Jesus was co-eternal and co-substantial of the same substance with the Father. The Nicene Creed, which affirmed this doctrine of the Trinity and covered other essential beliefs, was voted to be adopted by the council with only a few bishops, including Arius, refusing and becoming essential for the definition of Orthodox Catholic Christian faith. In the transformative period following Constantine's conversion to Christianity, the Roman Empire saw the implementation of numerous laws deeply influenced by Christian ethics. Sunday was established as a universally observed day of rest and worship for Christians. There is a prohibition against infanticide, outlawing the abandonment and killing of unwanted infants. Divorce laws are tightened, making separation more challenging to obtain and requiring specific grounds such as adultery or cruelty. Crucifixion is abolished and was no longer seen as an acceptable form of execution. And the treatment of slaves saw significant improvements. Laws were introduced to protect slave families from being separated and to grant slaves the right to file complaints against their masters. Lastly, there is promotion of charitable acts and the establishment of hospitals, orphanages and institutions to care for the poor and needy. 
However, one transformation warrants closer scrutiny, the approach to paganism following Constantine's reign. As we mentioned, Constantine and his co-emperor Licinius declared universal religious toleration in their so-called Edict of Milan in 313. Nonetheless, there is an important caveat to this. Eusebius in Book 2, Chapter 45 of his Life of Constantine tells us that after 324, a law was passed which placed considerable restrictions upon traditional state religion. He writes of this law that it provided that no one should erect images or practice divination and other false and foolish arts or offer sacrifice in any way. They were allowed to retain their temples and priesthoods and paganism, a form of belief, was tolerated, but its traditional cultic expression was threatened. The problem, however, is that paganism essentially comprised of these traditional cultic expressions. That is, the traditional Cultic expressions are essentially what religion meant in the ancient world. So, although it was not an outright ban on paganism, it practically would have been if carried out. It's important to remember that refusal to worship in the form of cultic sacrifice to the traditional deities of cities or peoples, or the deities that resented the empire itself, would have been seen as a grave impiety that brought the wrath of the gods and the people. In other words, sacrifices were not an optional extra. Considering this, it's no wonder that proponents of the ancient deities uh, contended that the devastating sack of Rome in 410 was a consequence of the abandoning of the worship and sacrifices to the traditional gods in favour of Christianity. This argument would have held considerable weight considering that this tragic event took place shortly after the shift in religious allegiance and marked the first time that Rome had fallen to such a fate in eight centuries. But returning to the prohibition on pagan sacrifice in 324, it is important to remember that edicts were not always an indication of enforcement. The historian H.A. Drake, in his article Constantine and Consensus, finds the evidence for a widespread ban of pagan sacrifice to be lacking. He writes, In his life of Constantine, Eusebius says Constantine ordered the traditional rites of animal sacrifice suppressed. It's clear that Constantine personally abhorred animal sacrifice and that he removed the requirement from the duties of imperial officials but the indications of a more sweeping ban can only be teased out of tenuous readings and marginal comments which then must be reconciled with abundant evidence for the continued performance of sacrifice on a fairly wide scale. The significant evidence for continued pagan sacrifice suggests that Constantine's policies may not have been uniformly enforced or entirely effective in eradicating pagan rituals, or even that Eusebius' claim of a universal ban was an exaggeration. Uh, Jonathan Bardell writes, Although it would appear that Constantine did not ban sacrifice outright, it's nonetheless conceivable that he issued a strong moral statement against sacrifice without ordering vigorous action against those who persisted in following the tradition. Whatever the precise legal situation, it's clear that pagan sacrifice continued in both East and West long after the Constantine victory in 324. Nonetheless, Theodosius III in 380 went one step further than Constantine or his predecessors in the Edict of Thessalonica, which effectively declared Nicene Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire. This is what it stated. It is our desire that all the various nations which are subject to our clemency and moderation should continue to profess that religion which was delivered to the Romans by the divine Apostle Peter as has been preserved by faithful tradition and which is now professed by the Pontiff Damascus, Bishop of Rome, and by Peter, Bishop of Alexandria, a man of apostolic holiness. According to the apostolic teaching and the doctrine of the gospel, let us believe in the one deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in equal majesty 
and the Holy Trinity. We authorise the followers of this law to assume the title of Catholic Christians. But as for the others, since in our judgment they are foolish madmen, we decree that they shall be branded with the ignominious name of heretics and shall not presume to give to their conventicles the name of churches. They will suffer in the first place the chastisement of the divine condemnation and in the second the punishment of our authority that in accordance with the will of heaven we shall decide to inflict. Therefore, this mandated Nicene Christianity is the only permissible form of faith outlawing other Christian sects and non-Christian religions. It not only reiterated the legislation which banned sacrifices but went one step further to outright ban paganism within the Roman Empire. But again, his edict only describes vague sanctions against offenders of a symbolic nature evoking divine condemnation, ignominy, without these threats being accompanied by any specific provision, not even of chasing heretics out of their places of worship. But it is made more stringent again in the Edict of Constantinople in 392, which prohibited the worship of the pagan gods, thereby making Christianity the exclusive state religion. The contemporary historian Theodoret, in Book 5 of his Ecclesiastical History, tells us in triumphant fashion of this shift that happened under Theodosius. Now the right faithful emperor diverted his energies to resisting paganism and published edicts in which he ordered the shrines of the idols to be destroyed. Constantine the Great, most worthy of all eulogy, was indeed the first to grace his empire with true religion, and when he saw the world still given over to foolishness, he issued a general prohibition against the offering of sacrifices to idols. He had not, however, destroyed the temples, though he ordered them to be kept shut. His sons followed their father's footsteps. Julian restored the false faith and rekindled the flame of the ancient fraud. On the accession of Jovian, he once more placed an edict on the worship of idols, and... Vartinian the Great governed Europe with like laws. Valens, however, allowed everyone else to worship in any way they would and to honour their various objects of adoration. Against the champions of the apostolic decrees alone, he persisted in waging war. Accordingly, during the whole period of his reign, the altar fire was lit, the libations and sacrifices were offered to idols, public feasts were celebrated in the forum, and votaries initiated in the orgies of Dionysus, ran about in goatskins, mangling hounds in Bacchic frenzy and generally behaving in such ways as to show the iniquity of their master. When the right faithful Theodosius found all these evils, he pulled them up by their roots and consigned them to oblivion. Nonetheless, this enforcement unfolded over several decades as Christianity continued to grow and consolidate its position within the empire. There are examples of pagan temples being destroyed, most famously in the the Serapium in 391, but it was more common for pagan temples to be converted into Christian churches. Therefore, we find that Theodosius I significantly moved away from the religious tolerance established by Constantine in the Edict of Milan in 313, which had effectively sought to end the persecution of Christianity. As Rain Forrest writes, The Edict of Milan was annulled in the Edicts of Thessalonica and Constantinople. Christianity was elevated to the state religion and pagan cults prohibited, even in private. Nonetheless, despite the suppression of paganism, decree in 393 in the Codex Theodosianus declared the Jewish sect is protected by law, no synagogues shall be despoiled, no regulation may be passed to ban Judaism even in the name of Christianity. Therefore, while Christianity was made the exclusive state religion and pagan practices were suppressed, the legal protections granted to Judaism in this decree show that there was at least some degree of tolerance for other monotheistic faiths. So, how did Augustine respond to this? This we shall now turn.
When it comes to Augustine's take in the City of God on the institutional Christianization of the Roman Empire, which had taken place during his lifetime, he had a deeply nuanced understanding that diverged significantly from that of his predecessor, Eusebius of Caesarea. For those who don't know, the church historian Eusebius from a century earlier wrote a history of the church from the first century to his present day, which reached its climax with Constantine. Eusebius's biography of Constantine, called Life of Constantine, has also been a major source of our information about the emperor himself. From the very outset of this biography, Constantine is depicted as standing in a special relationship with God. He states that Constantine, alone among all those who have ruled the Roman Empire, became a friend of the all-sovereign God. Moreover, he goes into detail to describe Constantine's piety, but in doing so intentionally leaves out any mention of some of the unsavoury actions, such as the murder of his eldest son, Crispus, and his wife, Fausta, who were both executed at his orders. For Eusebius, the interests of the church and the Roman Empire after Constantine are pointing in the same direction. In other words, with the conversion of Constantine and the Christianization of the Roman Empire, a new and special time in the history of the world had begun, a new eschatological reality. For Augustine, this is markedly not the case. In fact, in Book 5, Augustine mentions that Constantine's success is not to be attributed to the fact that he was a Christian. As evidence of this, Augustine points to how God removed the Christian emperor Joven from the throne faster than he did the apostate emperor Julian. The difference between Augustine and Eusebius comes down to a different eschatological vision and view of God's activity in history. We do not think that we can achieve the city of God on earth in this age. Instead, the city of God and the city of man are intermixed and intermingled and we have to wait for the age to come and the last judgment when God separates the two. If anything, the life of Constantine and the emperors that precede him, as well as the Roman Empire and the institutional church, are all marked by this intermingling and the intermixing of the two cities. But as Gustin makes clear, while the two cities are intermingled, we also make use of the peace of Babylon. In other words, just as the prophet Jeremiah ordered the Israelite captives to pray for the welfare of Babylon, Christians ought to work towards the thriving of the Roman Empire and its emperor for the sake of the common good and peace, whilst at the same time avoiding ascribing to it divine authority and power. In Book 19, Augustine describes two distinct households of men, and this framework enables Augustine to offer the more nuanced interpretation of the Constantinian shift. One household of men who do not live by faith tries to find an earthly peace in the goods and advantages which belong to this temporal life, whereas the other household of men lives by faith and looks forward to the blessings which are promised as eternal in a life to come. The institutions of the church, of the empire, are not necessarily congruent then with the true invisible church. Augustine is thereby communicating a more nuanced message. He, on the one hand, is pointing out the empire is not to be opposed or ignored by Christians. They are to further its thriving. But he is, on the other hand, saying that the empire is not divine. It's only a temporary arrangement pertaining to the Christian the order of their mortality. Hence, the empire is, for Augustine, something to be reckoned with, but it's not to be ascribed divine authority. In response to the Constantinian shift, Augustine's conception of the Christian faith therefore starts a process of internalization of Christianity. If everyone in the empire was supposed to be Christian, especially after the edicts of Theodosius, which mandated Nicene Christianity as a state religion, the outer and visible aspects of Christianity are no longer distinctive, and what makes someone truly Christian is internalized. But besides this, Augustine also argues for tolerance based on love. The unconditional love of God is the basis of the relation to oneself and to others as creatures of God. Since nobody is without weakness and sin, human beings need to be patient and tolerant towards one another. Moreover, the presence of heretics and enemies tests the patience, wisdom, benevolence, and sometimes even the discipline of the church, ultimately contributing to its spiritual and growth and resilience. This tolerance should even persist to the point of physical or spiritual suffering as is ultimately beneficial. 
since it is born out of love and a desire for the salvation of others. In this regard, Augustine often cites Jesus who tolerated and endured even his most bitter adversaries as an example of this attitude. He did not return an eye for an eye in pursuit of vengeance, but instead turned the other cheek as an act of love. Tolerance then is not just an act of self-restraint towards others, but an expression of sacrificial love. Moreover, it's important that human beings not set themselves up as the final judge, since it is in the purview of God alone to disentangle these threads at the last judgment. As such, the virtue of tolerance is to be practiced by Christians towards those who differ in beliefs and behavior, at least until the day of judgment. As he writes, For patience itself will not be eternal, since it's only necessary where there are evil to be born. Rather, it's the goal attained through patience that will be eternal. Until this time, though, unity is preserved through tolerance, as peaceful efforts are made to convince apostates and not violence. For example, Augustine repeatedly sought out conversations with the Donatists to convince them that their interpretation of scripture was incorrect. Importantly, Augustine himself went on a journey from Manichaeism to Neoplatonism to Christianity. Augustine underwent a conversion experience and he desired the same freedom for others, which is achieved through repentance leading towards salvation. But the extent of tolerance of non-Catholic Christians in Augustine is a contested one. For example, when it comes to the Donatist controversy, it is clear that early on, from at least 390 to 400, as we find in his personal letters, he was very much opposed to violent suppression. Edward L. Smith writes, Prior to 405, Augustine actively endeavoured to convert Donatists to the Catholic Church. His letters were quite kind and respectful in their tone and generally included an invitation to meet personally. The main themes of both his letters and books in this period included teaching on the true nature of the church, teaching on the proper theology and practice of baptism, a consideration of the origins of Donatist Catholic schism and appeal for Donatists to return to the true church. Augustine's invitation by letter for a personal meeting was realised on several occasions during this period as he travelled to visit and debate a number of Donatist leaders. His influence in the African church councils also encouraged the African bishops to approach their Donatist counterparts in a friendly and persuasive manner. Augustine's only request of the state prior to 405 was that the Catholic Church be protected against the more violent elements of the Donatist party. Therefore, Augustine would rather engage in dialogue persuasion as he was concerned that coercion resulted simply in false conversions which harmed the health of the church. We do, however, see Augustine become more accepting of coercive action against heretics following Rome's increased involvement in settling the controversy. With the issue of the Edict of Unity in 405, Donatist clergy and lay people were essentially coerced into becoming Catholic. Donatists who, do, who did not repent were punished with loss of civic rights. By 412 and 414, heavy fines were imposed on Donatist holdouts. Augustine, in the two years following the edict, witnessed its effectiveness and he became convinced of the ability of his community to absorb the new converts. He thus became more open to the use of coercive measures. For Augustine, though, coercion was the last resort strategy to be utilised in appropriate cases and only with sorrow. In letter 105, dated to around 410, addressed to the Donatists, he notes that Catholics first resorted to the use of persuasive rhetoric but were compelled to reply with more coercive means when a Donatist responded with violence. He writes, We were happy to preach the truth and to let each person listen to it in security and choose of his own free will. You have always prevented us from doing this by your violence and terrorism examine the behaviour of your circumcellions, then you'll see what has stirred this all up against you. He goes on to defend the Catholics' reliance on Roman authority to repress the Donatists, writing, How much more ought we use the ordained authorities which God has subjected to Christ as his prophet foretold to resist your madness in order to free wretched souls from your control and to uproot the 
long-standing falsehood. As Mary Imparato concludes regarding Augustine in her dissertation on religious toleration, one ceases tolerating error when the error brings about is so great that coercion is justified. In this case, one is pursuing the good. In other words, his own experience led him to conclude that love could demand the use of coercion, especially if such heretical groups are leading Catholics astray and have resorted to violence. That is, if you love your neighbour but do nothing in the face of violence, then you are guilty of wrongdoing. Therefore, if a heretical movement has disturbed the peace of the community, a coercive response can be appropriate. But at the same time, Augustine is also careful to distinguish between the necessity of compelling the schematics to come back in and respecting the conscience of pagans or Jews whom he views as blind to the truth, for whom he advocated toleration. In this regard, although he doesn't com comment directly on the edicts of Theodosius and the suppression of paganism, it hardly makes sense within this overall scheme. Coercing pagans for Augustine was futile, for it commanded them to accept a truth to which they were blind. The Donatists, on the other hand, were merely being recalled to the flock to which they rightly belonged and from which they had strayed. Therefore, coercion was part of the church's pastoral activity among its own flock, rather than violence against outsiders, such as coercing pagans. Okay, that is it for this video. We have certainly covered a lot of ground, from the conversion of Augustine himself, to the events leading up to the composition of his magnus opus, City of God, namely the sack of Rome in 410, to the main theme of the book of the two cities, and the Christianization of the Roman Empire after Constantine, and the response from Augustine. So, in the next video, we're finally going to dive into Book 1, City of God. So be sure to stay tuned. And remember, if you've enjoyed this video, to give it a like and do let me know your thoughts in the comments. Okay, I'll see you next time. Bye!